Try to get me in a room, yeah. Everybody wanna talk, why? Always coming with the tunes, mm. They know I'ma take it far, right? Something I already knew, yeah. Never needed your applause, nah. They been saying it's a flu, mm. This is not a false alarm, nah. You spoke, just speaking a little bit about off field balance and bringing that on field, there are some things that we mentioned before that can sometimes disrupt that balance, and that's the press. That's these tweets or Instagram comments or all these things. So you kind of mentioned sometimes or here and there you might fall into the trap of, of reading things. And we had a player on Mile Corbos who plays here in Germany who said sometimes it's the good press as well that can, can be just as effective because, you know, you're concentrated on that and you're so happy to attach yourself to that. So when you don't see it, it can become quite like that balance disruptor. So can you speak a little bit more about your relationship with this and kind of the off-field comments that come with you just in your performance? Yeah, I mean, something my dad's always taught me is like, don't get too high on the highs and don't get too low on the lows and just kind of staying in that middle consistent area. Because I mm -hmm. think like you said, yeah. if you get too high on the highs, like you're just kind of going to get a little bit too like in your head, too big of a head. Like it's never a good look. And then if you're too low on your lows, then it kind of just affects you just as much. So I think that can go same with the tweets, like read the super great tweets about yourself and don't read the super not good. Tweet. Like I just try to read the team, the team stuff. And I think that's helped me a lot. Like anytime I see something specifically about like Savannah and Demello, I try not to read it. Mm -hmm. I'll read like racing Louisville as a whole. Mm -hmm. if you know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. Right, right. And I and I'm sure like the the off field balance and having the circle that you have can be humbling in a way because it brings you out of that and you're not just always associating yourself as Savannah DeMille, the soccer player, and like that becomes the entire identity. I think that's also a tough thing. Yeah, I mean, I think I've met my like some of my two best friends were on are on this team. And, but we also like, I don't think we ever talk about soccer to like, we watch soccer and we talk about like that kind of soccer and we'll watch film together. But like, I was joking with one of them the other day. I'm like, I always forget you're my teammate, like genuinely forget you're my teammate. Cause we do so much stuff outside of soccer together that I think you're like, I just think you're like family now. I don't know. Mm -hmm. And then that's great. younger sister. Yeah. I'm super close with, and they both play soccer too, but still like I always forget like my middle sister Michaela I'm like I forget like you're in college playing soccer like sometimes I forget to ask, how was your game you know because I think we have so much other things to talk about like such a bigger relationship than just soccer but soccer is a like it is a like we do talk about it but it's not like the biggest part of our life our relationship yeah I mean I think it just helped me mature so quick and like I got to see soccer at like the biggest, like kind of the biggest stage at a youth level and just made me hungry for more, more of those moments. I wanted to be around that more. And it kind of happened around high school. I was kind of getting all that exposure and I was like, oh, like, hell yeah, this is what I want to do versus like what everyone else is doing back home. So it kind of just helped me stay on my journey and like made me, I'm like, yeah, these are the decisions I'm going to make because that's the path I want to be on. So I think the youth like national team is just like, it just helped me so much. And I learned so much from so many different coaches and I'm playing with girls from all around the world against girls, like who live in France. And I just think it took my game to the next level. Um, I went to my first twenties, I think I was 16 and all the girls were like 19, 20. So me and like Mal, you guys know Mal Pew, obviously. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah. He was on my team too. Ashley Sanchez, like Emily Fox, we were all younger players on that U20 team. And I mean, I didn't have a huge role on the team, but I learned again, so much from the players, from being in that, being in a world cup environment, like I was 16 and I left home for like a month and a half in Papua New Guinea. Like it just helped me grow so much. So by the time it was for my U20 age group and we went to the world cup, like, I was just, I already felt like a veteran in that environment. And I just felt like I was able to um, kind of thrive in that just because of those past experiences. 
and playing at this level, the U.S., you know, the, the, the national team, that encapsulates pretty much the highest level you can play at in the youth. Mm-hmm. And you played at, at very high levels in college and, and, and youth, I'm sure, as well. But what was that balance like to kind of have that competition and then come back maybe into club or high school or college soccer and still, one, remain humble because you're playing at such a high level, but two, also push yourself in this level that may not be as competitive at the level you just were? Yeah, I mean, I I, I always talk to my dad about this because I do think it is hard because, like, I don't want to – like necessarily be rude and like if the level isn't the same like getting on players in like a a rude way but I think there's a balance with that and I think when I came back as much as I would like focus on my details I would in like a positive way like try to up the level back at the college level club in a positive way and I think my personality is in no way loud and like mean so I kind of just would bring like myself like how I would do things back to my club environment and like try to up the level mm-hmm. and it, kind of make like lead in my own unique way. Right. And how do you feel that kind of benefits your game? Like how have you seen your game grow in terms of when your goal is to help other people get better? How has that improved your own game? Oh, I think it's funny when I got injured, I think I grew the most within that year of not playing because I all I was doing was watching like my teammates and like doing film and doing scouting reports and all that like I learned so much because I think it it gives you a different point of view in the game and I mean I just think watching soccer is so important so if I can like help other players around me it's only going to make me better first of all and then it just gives me a different perspective of the game. And how about the call up to the U.S. women's national team, having the balance of it's a dream come true, yet, I mean, you're there to work and you're there for a reason and you have to prove yourself once you get there. Yeah, I mean, I think it's that's the hardest thing to get to is that national team level. I mean, in the U.S., there is so much talent and so many people to choose from. So when I was chosen, I just felt honored. But it was like that thing that happened when I got when I got drafted, like you get, I get super, I got super pumped, but then I'm like, shoot, I'm going to play against Lindsay Horan, Rose Lavelle, like all these players that I've grown up watching next week. So I got to like start working. So it's kind of like, you're super proud of yourself and like a little, like, good job. Like this is a huge moment, but then like, okay, now it's like more expectations. Like we got to be ready, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's like that pinnacle again, the hunger for more. Yeah, and, no, I mean, I mean, I think that's what makes like us like athletes and like soccer players like so elite is that when we reach our goals, we actually already have new goals that we've been setting to like get to higher spot. You know what I mean? It's like mm-hmm, we're yeah. kind of like we're never satisfied because we want what's next. But that's what mm-hmm. makes us I think, why we are like where we are on this this time with injuries and then also you know time with studying at USC some great times some some uh, tons of awards conference awards all American as well but also this Achilles injury which took you out for a full year and you talked about what that kind of that opportunity also presented in terms of growth away and being able to look at the game in a new way how did you approach your time away from playing though besides this and and, and you know having starting to find that balance because when you're injured it's very hard yeah so before I got injured it it's like in, injuries never happen at a good time but I think it actually was like the worst time to get injured because I was um I was just doing really well I was going to get called into like a camp and I actually was going to leave college and like go pro early like I had like steps and mm-hmm. I was leave that fall and then it happened so it kind of just, it took me like a month after my injury because I was like in a really like not a good state to finally start looking at the positives and being like, okay, like I'm not going to be a soccer player now for a year. So now I have to like look within and like, I know that I'm more than a soccer player, but do I actually know that? And then mm-hmm. so I started doing things like it, we had a summer, we had the summer off. So I traveled a lot. Um, I went to Europe, watched a lot of soccer. And I kind of 
fell in love with the game again because I think I was overworked up until my injury and like kind of burnt out a little bit, which I always promised myself I would never do. But I think when you're so caught up in things, you kind of fr like throw that out the window. So I think I finally, after my injury happened, I finally tuned in back with myself and um, helped me kind of find myself again. Who am I? Um, I'm more than just a soccer player, all that. So I think that it actually like silver lining with things kind of made me hungry then again to get back into things because I finally was not as burnt out. That's great. That, that statement, that statement is like, it's, it's funny when you said that like injuries never happen at a good time. I feel like every injury that I've ever had just like flashed in my brain at that moment. Like that's, I don't know if you, I don't know if you meant to be that deep, but it's a, it's a very deep sentence. It yeah. I, it, it really, it, I mean, it's such a hard thing. So, yeah. There's something to I, that. I got to think more about that. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, that's it's nice. I like it, but I mean, hate the injury part of it, but the right the statement just rings true. I mean, did it? I mean, t talking about that, like that relationship, and then feeling, you know, seeing the steps that you had in your career and your journey to pro, and seeing it all lined out, and then having this one roadblock. I mean, how? What were the, what were some ways that you felt like? the steps you were able to take to say like, no, my professional career isn't over. Like it's just, this is just the time now and a new time will come. Yeah. Well, I think like, so I went to college close to home. So it was huge to have like my family with me during the process and to everybody else. It like, it looked like that. It looked like, okay, this is just like a little, or not a little, but this is like a big hole that we got to get out of. But to me, I thought it was the end of the world. Mm. And like, I think it's good to have those people that like believe in you, trust in you. Cause they're like, Oh, okay. Like this is happening, but like we, you, have you seen like what you've done? Like you can get back there. And so I never really had like a huge injury too prior to this. Like I, I did, I like tore my quad, which is like not good, but like, this was like my first like huge injury where I was out for like, it was even longer than a year. It was like a year and a half, honestly, because it took so long to recover from. Um, but I think just like I said, having those people and then my coaches made it very well known that like, listen, like once you're back, you'll have one more year of eligibility and then like just kill it that year. We'll get you ready. Um, we have the best like PT, like trainers here, like you'll be fine. Just work on your mental side because that's what's going to like, that's what you can focus on right now. So I think just controlling the controllables was huge for me. And um, but my coach is still like had me play a huge part of the team, which I think helped me mentally. I still felt like I was contributing in some way. Mm. And I mean, obviously we never want injuries to happen, but do you feel like without this injury, you wouldn't be as mentally strong as you are now to attack the professional game? Oh, totally. I mean, like I, I never would say, like, but like I'm, I wouldn't like change what happened for anything. Like I think what, everything that happened was meant to happen and who knows where I would be now if it wasn't for that injury. So yeah. I'm just, I'm grateful for all the lessons I learned. And then it happened at a, also like a really weird time. Cause right when I was coming back, COVID happened. Mm. So like I was trying so hard to get ready for a season that didn't end up not happening. So I actually had more time to then get back into shape get back like being confident on the ball so by the time season was there I was more than ready so kind of everything happened for a reason you know sort of thing mm -hmm. yeah <laughs>